At the beginning, the very beginning of the creation of my ensemble, we had a very unfortunate name, which essentially was suggested to us by some elected people from the Ile de France who were giving us a bit of money. And it was going to be called the um, Ensemble Baroque et Vocal uh, Baroque de l'Ile de France, which was uh, not a very happy choice of a, of a name. And one day I was um, having a rehearsal with my singers and my, and my instrumental players, and we were actually rehearsing a piece called Les Arts which is a, a marvelous little mini opera of Marc Antoine Charpentier. And one of our singers, uh, Michel Laplaini, uh, his name is, um, at one point during rehearsal, closed his book and started to mutter, Les Arts Florissants, Les Arts Florissants, Les Arts Flo, uh, oui. Ben voilà, uh, j'ai trouvé le nom, I found the name. We're not going to be called that awful name with too many syllables and too many words. We're going to be simply called Les Arts Florissants. And since everybody loves abbreviations in France, it'll become Les Arts Flo. And it's stuck. Composers like writers, like painters, like sculptors, um, live moments of, of, of glory, and then live moments of less glory, sort of simply just um, being forgotten. Um, it's not hard to sort of remind uh, 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 people today that Bach uh, was forgotten after his death. Um, very few composers actually can sort of withstand the, uh, the ravages of taste and, 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 and musical change. Um, most composers uh, have been rediscovered. Those, that's to say, those composers who have lived you know, 400 or 300 or 200 years ago. Um, and then they're rediscovered for reasons simply because, um, yes, the music is grand and great. Uh, if Bach had to be rediscovered, well, someone who is perhaps not as, as grand as Bach, like um, Marc Antoine Charpentier, had even worse sort. You see. And the French, let's face it, are notoriously um, uh, dependent on what they call la mode. Um, musical taste changes. Uh, let's face it, I mean, uh, uh, Bach did not write the way that Beethoven did, and Beethoven did not write the way that Wagner did. And it seems that every generation discovers something better and new, you see. Um, it's perfectly obvious to me that, um, yes, uh, uh, he had to sort of have a, uh, a, 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 a Marc Arnold Charpentier had to sort of have a moment of dormancy where he simply was forgotten by everybody, uh, and then a rediscovery. Uh, we've been part of this process. Um, I didn't rediscover Marc Antoine Charpentier, but I certainly have contributed, along with my ensemble, to making him into, uh, once again, a great composer of the French Baroque. Charpentier is an original composer and a unique composer when he's compared to um, his contemporaries in France. Um, he arrives essentially uh, as a, a mature young composer from Italy. Um, and he could write in the Italian style, which is very different than the French style. However, he was French and lived in Paris. And so he essentially, during the course of his lifetime, uh, learned to be both French and Italian. Um, his originality is the fact that um, he's a little bit better than almost everybody he was uh, compared to. Uh, if I today um, can have a, 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 a good, long, and hard look at, at the, as a musicologist and as a performing musician at the sort of the, the totality of, of French music making of the end of the 17th century, that includes people like Lully, um, Deslandes and, uh, and Charpentier, of course. Uh, I'd say that, hands down, uh, Charpentier is the best composer. He's certainly the person who had the most under his belt in terms of musical experience. Um, 
he wasn't by any means the most important or the most popular back then. That was Louis. Um, the question that you've asked me is, um, why is his theater music um, uh, underestimated and, uh, and is it important? Yes, it's very important, but the fact is he couldn't do it because there was a monopoly on essentially staged music, music for the theater, or if you will, opera. And this monopoly was held by Lully, Jean-Baptiste Lully, who was a very important man, a very important composer, uh, in terms of the synthesis of ideas, perhaps even more important than, um, than Charpentier. But he was a ruthless man. He was an unpleasant man. And he was the king's favorite. And because he was in favor with the king, he was able to engineer uh, a title. He became the surintendant de la musique. And he had control essentially over everything that had to do with music on stage, which meant that no one else could write the way he could. You see. So essentially, Charpentier uh, uh, lived most of his life as a, a very, very good composer of church music, of sacred music. That didn't, however, prevent him from being immensely talented as a, as a writer for the stage. Moliere knew that because when Moliere, after Moliere had a, a row with Lully, uh, Moliere turns to, to Charpentier and uh, it's Charpentier who writes for the theater in a limited way because of the, because of the restrictions imposed by, by Lully. Lully dies in 87, 1687, and it gives not only Charpentier, but other composers, the chance to shine, uh, free from these tyrannical sort of uh, uh, restraints imposed by, by Lully. And it's that moment where he increases his production of essentially secular music and writes at the end of the century uh, probably what is the most brilliant and the most moving, I think, of all of the great tragedies lyriques, which is Médée. <laughs> 